You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 100, No Man Han, Part 2, Opening Phases. This week, a big thank you goes out to Jose, who has decided to become a member, gaining access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special member-only episodes roughly every month. Head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more. As this is episode 100, and as I know that many listeners are waiting for the European phases of the Second World War to start on the podcast, I thought I would give a look at the road ahead. This episode today starts a three-episode series on the fighting around Nomanhan in the summer of 1939, fighting that would overlap with the German invasion of Poland in September of that year. Then, in episode 103, we will start a five-part series that I've entitled Europe Goes to War, which will focus on the events of the summer of 1939 as Europe moved closer and closer to war, covering topics like the growing tension in Danzig, the British and French guarantees of Polish borders, and preparations for war around the continent. That will be episode 103 to 107. Then in episode 108, there will be an episode where I will just give some reflections on all of the first 107 episodes of the podcast, looking at the events during the interwar period at a higher level to discuss kind of themes and trends, and to once again consider the question of whether or not war was inevitable. Then, in episode 109, the series of episodes on the German invasion of Poland will begin. If my math is correct, and I don't miss any weeks, that means that the first episode of the invasion will be released on August 24th, one week before the anniversary of the start of the invasion. But that is the future, and now we're going to return to the tensions between the Soviet Union and Japan in Eastern Asia in 1939 this time moving away from the Maritime Province and into Outer Mongolia. The fighting that would occur during the Battle of Kalkangol, or as part of the Nomanhan Incident, if you are the Japanese, would be the largest fighting that would take place between the Soviet Union and Japan in the 1930s. It was larger than the clash over Chen Kufeng in the summer of 1938 in every conceivable way. More troops were involved, they fought over a lengthier period of time, and more of them would become casualties. The results would also have a greater and and more far-reaching set of impacts, and it would force the Japanese army to come to grips with the fact that they were in a bad place when matched up with the Red Army. The overall course of the fighting near Nomanhan would in fact be one of the contributing factors to the eventual signature of the Soviet-Japanese non-aggression pact, which would last for almost the entirety of the Second World War, and, and would be critical to Russian planning during the German invasions after 1941. During this episode, we will look at why this remote area of Mongolia became so important, and the early stages of the fighting in the area as the two sides began to slowly increase their resources they were willing to commit to the fighting to try and achieve their goals. War between Japan and the Soviet Union had been an ongoing concern on both sides for many years before 1939. In the Japanese army, this was driven by the idea that it was the Soviet Union that was the prime threat to Japanese control of Eastern Asia. On the side of the Soviet Union, the concern was one of a brewing two-front war between the Soviet Union on one side and Germany and Japan on the other. 
One of the reasons that the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939 was so surprising to other nations was due to the fact that for most of the 1930s, the Soviet Union was one of Germany's most likely enemies, and no small amount of German official propaganda painted the Soviets as the great enemy. During the early years of the 1930s, there had been some discussions of a non-aggression pact between the Soviet government and Japan, but near the end of 1931, the Japanese would reject the proposal. This refusal and the general expansion of the Soviet military under the five-year plans would result in a shift in strength to the Far East by the Red Army, which would be in position to deal with any Japanese aggression. There was also an effort by the Mongolians, who actually controlled the area of the Nomanham battle, to increase their own military capacity in the last half of the 1930s. This was fully supported by the Soviets, and because it was coupled with the greater Red Army presence, it represented a large increase in total military strength that the Japanese would have to deal with. These resources would then be used in 1939 for several small border fights during the early months of the year. None of those skirmishes were large, but there were probably over 25 of them. You know, it's a very active area. The fighting that would occur near the outer Mongolian village of Nomanhan would be of a completely different type to these earlier skirmishes. As with the battle around Chengkufeng, this new battle would take place on a piece of disputed territory. In this case, a triangle of territory between the village of Nomanhan and the Kalkan Gol River. One small note here. Uh, Japanese sources refer to the river as the Halha River, uh, but it is referring to the same thing as what the Russians call the Kalkan Gol River. You know, just to add that extra bit of confusion. This was also one of those areas where there had been some treaties that had tried to settle the border disputes during the late 1800s, but those were based on imprecise sort of location information, so there was debate around them. At its most basic level, the river was roughly 10 kilometers to the west of Nomanhan. The Soviets claimed that they controlled everything from the river to the village of Nomanhan, while the Japanese claimed that they controlled everything between the river and Nomanhan. And it would be in this area that the fighting would occur. While these disputes around precisely where the border was between the two nations was a common cause of friction, there were some additional reasons that this disagreement specifically resulted in such a large confrontation. It comes back to something called Order 1488. This order originated from the Kwantung Army headquarters because they were generally pretty disappointed in what they saw as the tendency of Japanese frontline commanders to be hesitant and overly cautious. To try and get around this, the Japanese units at the front were told to, you know, not move across the border but to react far more aggressively if the Soviets tried to move in what, into what was considered Japanese territory. The precise name of the document that was sent out was, quote, Principles for the Settlement of soviet Manchukuan Border Disputes, and it would be presented on April 25, 1939, at a meeting of the Kwantung Army High Command and Divisional Commanders. Here is a lengthy quote from the order, which touches on some of the most important points. Quote, If the enemy crosses the frontier, annihilate him without delay, employing strength carefully built up beforehand. To accomplish our mission, it is permissible to enter Soviet territory or to trap or lure Soviet troops into Manchukuan territory and allow them to remain there for some time. Where boundary lines are not clearly defined, Area defense commanders will, upon their own initiative, establish boundaries and indicate them to the forward elements. In the event of an armed clash, fight until victory is won regardless of relative strengths or of the location of the boundaries. If the enemy violates the borders, friendly units must challenge him courageously and endeavor to triumph in their zone of action without considering themselves about the consequences which will be the responsibility of higher headquarters, end quote. There are a few important pieces I want to highlight out of that lengthy quote. First up, the Kwantung army was putting it on the local commanders to make the decision in instances where borders were poorly defined, telling them to establish where the boundaries were and stick to it. It's very dangerous to push such information or such responsibility down to local army officers. 
The second is contained in the words, quote, fight until victory is won regardless of relative strengths, end quote. This essentially meant that not only should local commanders choose where they were going to fight and why, but if they did choose to fight, they were basically fighting either until victory or death. Remember these two items because they'll come back later and they'll be a big driver of events over the next several episodes. This order was also forwarded to Tokyo, although there was apparently no response. These orders were received by all Japanese officers in the theater, including General Komatsubara, the commander of the 23rd Division. The 23rd Division had only been formed about a year before it would be called to fight at Nomanhan, and it was made up primarily of reservists, fresh recruits, and other personnel who had aged out of frontline service in higher quality units. It would be the 23rd that would be on the border when the fighting with the Soviet Union would begin. And this was because so many of the best Japanese troops had already been sent to China, and there was a desire to keep several of Japan's best divisions always rested and and ready at full strength to meet any serious Soviet aggression. So those units were not on the front line or at the border areas, they were behind in reserve. The war with China had already required seven new divisions to be created in 1938, with the 23rd being one of them, and it would require nine more in 1939. And with this massive expansion, which basically doubled the size of the Imperial Army, it put pressure on manpower and equipment reserves. For units like the 23rd Division who were formed at this time, it meant that they were not getting kind of the top rungs of manpower or equipment. To give the Japanese Army's own evaluation of the 23rd Division, it would be rated as below medium. While the men had either seen too many winters or too few, the state of their equipment was even worse. This was again due to the demands of the fighting in China, which meant that most of the non-top-of-the-line divisions did not have their full complement of equipment, especially in vehicles and heavy artillery. All this really meant was that the most important unit for the fighting at Nomenhan would be very unprepared for the ordeal that it was about to be put through. It may sound dull, Maybe even monotonous. But this is what miracles sound like. This is the sound of a child's surgery being performed by a robot. Our personalized care leads to miraculous things. Like innovative procedures with less pain and faster recovery. Children's Hospital Colorado. Here, it's different. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. The precise events that started the fighting around Nomanhan are fuzzy. Both sides generally claim that the other was the one that violated the border first, with the Japanese claiming that Mongolian cavalry rode onto their side of the border, while the Mongolian sources, which the Soviets agree with, claim that it was actually the Japanese who were the ones that made the violation first. The fun part is that both of these facts can be true, uh, because neither side agreed on where the border actually was. The first week of the fighting is generally just a series of very confused events, with both sides having different stories that don't completely match up. 
This would later change as the overall course of events would solidify as larger and larger units were brought into the action, but that only really starts happening after May 17th. What can be generally determined is that the fighting would begin on May 11th, when a group of Mongolian cavalry would clash with soldiers of the 23rd Division that were positioned to guard the Japanese definition of the border. While this would kick off a major confrontation between the two armies, this incident in the early morning hours of May 11th had happened, in some variation, countless times before in other areas of the border. A small bit of fighting, maybe a few casualties, and then everything would cool down again and go back to normal. But this time, it would be different. The catalyst for this change would be Order 1488, because on May 13th, General Komatsubura was holding a conference to discuss the order with many of his staff and regimental officers, and it would be during this conference that news of the events at Nomenhan would arrive at the headquarters of the 23rd Division. While before, there had been some ambiguity about what was expected of Japanese units in this situation, after Order 1488 had been issued, all of that ambiguity was gone. They were expected to, quote, challenge him courageously and endeavor to triumph in their zone of action, end quote. With clear expectations, General Komatsubura made the decision to quickly send two infantry com companies, a cavalry troop, and an armored car company into the area under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Azuma Yaozo. This collection of units, generally referred to as the Azuma Detachment, would arrive in the area on May 15th. When Azuma arrived, he found that most of the Mongolian cavalry had already retreated out of the disputed territory and onto the other side of the river. This information was then relayed to the 23rd Division headquarters, and Komatsubura would order Azuma to withdraw, the mission seemingly complete, but of course it wasn't. This was because on the 15th, Red Army forces would arrive in the form of one battalion of the 149th Infantry Regiment of the 36th Infantry Division, and some armor and artillery assets would also arrive. These units would not initially cross the river, which would have brought them into conflict with the Japanese, but some Mongolian troops would cross the river again on the 17th. When news of this new violation reached Kamatsubura, he made the decision that such a violation so soon after the previous event demanded a swift and decisive response. To meet the new aggression, Komatsubura would send the 64th Infantry Regiment under the command of Colonel Yamagate Takamitsu, and it would be referred to as the Yamagata Detachment. It would contain about 800 infantry and artillery company with three 75mm mountain guns and four 37mm anti-tank guns, along with three companies of trucks. It would also absorb Azuma's group when it arrived. All of this gave Yamagata a total strength of around 2,000 men, and he would be given the task of destroying anything he found on the east side of the river. With the attack first scheduled to begin on the 22nd of May, before it was pushed back to the 27th due to challenges and getting everything ready. The overall plan for the attack was worked out in some detail, and it would share one feature with many of the Japanese plans from the following actions. It was, by and large, far too complex. It would involve Azuma's unit to be separated from the main group, and it would make an independent advance on the area where the Halha River met the smaller Holston River. Then the main body of Yamagata's forces would be split up into five different attack groups, which would advance in ways that required careful coordination. In theory, this could ensure that any Mongolian or Soviet troops that were on the eastern side of the river would be trapped by Azuma's men who would be hanging out at the bridges they would have to cross, which would present some nice opportunities. But it was very risky, especially given the fact that the Japanese had very little idea of what kind of resistance they would be facing. They knew that there were some troops that had recrossed the river on the 20th, but beyond that, it was mostly just an empty map with some guesses. It probably would have worked out, this complicated attack plan, if it had met only weak and feeble resistance, which had been the case in several of the previous border clashes. But in this case, the Japanese would not come up against a small and easily deterred enemy. What they were facing was a collection of Red Army and Mongolian units, which were under the command of Major Baikov. There would be roughly 1,000 men, including 16 armored cars, four 76mm artillery guns, and other assorted equipment, 
Along with these troops under Baikov, there would be several other units, including reconnaissance units and artillery batteries, nearby. The attack, the Japanese attack, would kick off in the early hours of the 28th, and there would be some initial success. The Japanese were able in those early hours to take advantage of some key sort of advantages that they had. The first was simply numbers. There were many more Japanese than there were men opposing them. They were also able to find quick success against units of Mongolian cavalry that had been in the center of the Soviet line. These units were generally less equipped to deal with the Japanese attack. They were only lightly armed and did not have the equipment backing them up that the Red Army troops had access to. But the Japanese advantages that they found in those early hours would begin to evaporate as they moved closer to the river. Because as they moved to the west, they grew closer and closer to the Soviet artillery and various support units of armored cars. This included Azuma's detachment, which was making its run for the bridges over the river. They had expected the bridges to only be lightly held by a few units, but what they found was that it was protected by a Soviet infantry company, a group of combat engineers, armored cars, and artillery. Azuma's men had nothing with which to deal with the armored vehicles, and they were basically stopped in their tracks. This caused a serious problem, because Azuma had greatly overextended into enemy territory. His goal had been to secure the bridges until the rest of the Japanese forces arrived under Namagata. But it was not going to arrive, because the main Japanese attack had also been ground to a halt. By midday, Azuma was already surrounded, and his unit would begin to be attacked from multiple different sides. Azuma, who was under orders to attack and not retreat, was determined to hold his ground as long as possible. To make matters worse, the Soviets were bringing additional reinforcements into the fight very quickly, including the rest of the 149th Infantry Regiment and additional artillery. This made Azuma's defense hopeless, and as the afternoon wore on, the Soviet attackers ground their way closer and closer to Azuma's positions. Then in the evening, understanding that the fight was almost over, Azuma and all of his remaining men led a final charge on the enemy, which was quickly ended by Soviet machine guns. Of the men who had attacked with Azuma, several hundred of them, four would manage to escape the Soviet encirclement. All the rest were killed or captured. When the disaster became known to the 23rd Division headquarters, there was a scramble to push forward more artillery and anti-tank weaponry, and even some additional infantry on May 29th. These reinforcements allowed the Japanese to partially recover, continue their attack at least a little bit, and to recover 200 Japanese bodies, including that of Azuma. But with a quarter of the original Yamagata detachment now casualties, the additional forces in no way allowed for a complete transformation of the overall situation near Nomahan. One thing that worked in favor of the Japanese troops that were in the Nomahan area was that the transport situation on the side of the Soviets was abysmal, which would hamper their operations for the entirety of the campaign, because the nearest Soviet rail link was 700 kilometers to the west, which meant that everything had to be transported by truck or horse cart over that distance. In comparison, the Japanese railheads were around 200 kilometers away, a, a more manageable distance. To make matters worse for the Soviets, the road network in the region, when there were roads at all, was not exactly the most optimal for the transport of tons and tons of military goods. There were some attempts to ameliorate this problem over the course of the summer of 1939, but in an effort to build more rail lines faster, the decision was made to use a narrower gauge, which meant that everything had to be unloaded and reloaded onto different rail cars on its way to the front. If it had only been a few rail cars a day, maybe no big deal. But at its peak, the Soviet and Mongolian forces around Nomanhan would require 2,000 tons of various material every single day. While the fighting on the ground was only going to ramp up after May, the fighting in the air would be on a similar trajectory. Unlike in Chengkufeng, the Japanese would commit air squadrons to assisting the ground units during the fighting, which would be met by a similar commitment by the Red Army Air Force. The early fighting over the battle area was heavily in favor of the Japanese due to the fact that the only aircraft in the area for the Soviets were the generally heavily outmatched I-15 biplanes. This resulted in heavy losses for very little gain any time the Soviet aircraft ventured over the river in an attempt to participate in the battle. 
Eventually, the order was given to halt all Soviet air operations, which would still be the case when the Japanese attack was launched on May 28th, which heavily contributed to the early successes experienced by Yamagata's forces because there was no Soviet air reconnaissance happening at that time. The balance of forces in the area would very quickly shift in completely the opposite direction, though, because more and more Soviet aircraft would be moved in to airfields surrounding Nomanhan, and they would be flying newer models as well. This eventually put the Japanese into the position of being heavily outmatched. To try and gain an advantage or regain an advantage in the air, the Japanese would launch a bombing raid of Soviet air bases in the area, operations that were strategically not mentioned in reports to Japan. The fear was once again that they would be cancelled due to the desire in Tokyo to avoid any kind of wider escalation. So, the Kwantung Army headquarters simply didn't tell Tokyo what they were doing. When this bombing raid was launched in late June, it would actually be pretty successful. They would reach several different airfields, drop 50 kilogram bombs, and, and fly back. The Japanese would estimate that 98 aircraft were fully destroyed, although the number was almost certainly less than 98. Russian fighter aircraft had been able to take off in some instances to try and stop the bombers, uh, but they were mobbed by the fighter aircraft that had accompanied the Japanese bomber formations. While the attack would be judged a success and would give at least some level of respite for the Japanese air units, it would also prove to be yet another heavy blow to relations between the Kwantung leadership and the high command back on the home islands. This relationship would be absolutely critical, and you didn't want any distrust and tensions in that relationship if, say, the fighting at Nomenhan grew bigger and needed more Japanese resources, maybe, maybe a different division to help out the 23rd. I sure hope that doesn't happen, because then all this tension and distrust could be, could, could be a real problem for the Japanese. But, but surely, it'll be okay. <laughs> 